Good evening, everybody. Can you all hear me fine? Oh, no, I see old friends in the audience. How very nice. I'm Elizabeth Palmer. I'm a correspondent for CBS News, and I covered Iraq and continue to cover Iraq whenever I can get there. Um, I'd like to welcome you all this evening. We have a, a panel of four guests. Uh, I know that you, you're all here because you want to, to, uh, to hear them, but let me introduce it in the order in which they're going to speak. First of all, Kamran Karadagi, to my right. Um, he, has, he is one of the great eminent uh, voices on Iraq as a diplomatic editor and foreign correspondent and also formerly chief of staff uh, for the Iraqi president, Jalal Talabani. Uh, second, we're going to go to Tom Hardy Forsyth on my left here, uh, a currently a senior advisor to the prime minister's office of the Kurdistan or Kurdistan regional government, I should say, uh, also a former military uh, officer and NATO official. Charles Tripp, to, to my left, uh, too along, a uh, professor of Middle East politics at SOAS and uh, an author of uh, at least one, several books on Iraq, Charles? A couple, yes. A couple of books <laughs> on Iraq. Uh, and finally, Patrick Coburn, also an eminent journalist who has logged a lot of hours in Iraq before and after the fall of Saddam Hussein um, and currently a columnist and a journalist for The Independent. The format this evening will be uh, an opening uh, preamble, if you like, or a statement by each of our speakers. I'm going to keep you to four, or did we say five minutes, Patrick? I don't know, five is pushing it. But but, all right. <laughs> That's what five is pushing it. Five's the outer limits. Um, and uh, after that, perhaps we can uh, br broaden some of the points you touch on in, in a little uh, mini debate up here at the front and then I'm going to throw the discussion open to you, the audience, because that's when it often really comes alive. With that, I'd like to uh, uh, hand over to you, uh, Mr. Karadagi, to begin. And the clock's ticking. Okay, I'll start, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> well, many, some people th think that this, uh, uh, th th this current uh, wave of violence has something to do with the uh, sentence of, of Vice President Tarek uh, al-Hashmi. <coughs> but uh, uh, actually, this is something which was meant to happen. And there is always, from time to time, a wave of, of uh, violence in Iraq. And as we were talking last year, there was a, a similar violence. And now there is another violence. Uh, and it, it might... Uh, continue for a while, stop, and then start again. Uh, m m my, my feeling is that uh, I also speak from experience, because uh, when I was working in Iraq, and I s somehow I felt always that uh, really there was never a, a real reconciliation among the different parties and components of, the, uh, of Iraqi political players. And, uh, uh, you would always feel that something uh, will happen, that they are uh, sticking together because of, uh, uh, of, the, of, of interests. They had an interest to keep the situation as it is, and also because they had uh, in different uh, interests, political, uh, social, uh, economical interests, which is more very important. And of course, uh, because being an uh, oil economy, Iraq had a lot of, of uh, money, cash, uh, and everybody in Iraq wanted uh, uh, to be part of it. So this is why, uh, as, as we see, despite all the problems, all the uh, <coughs> different views, all the uh, animosity between these parties, but n nobody actually left the government. They are all still in the government. And uh, I think that uh, this uh, kind of, of arrangement uh, will really uh, continue until the next election, which is in, uh, in, in two years' time. Uh, so that's what, what was happening, the, especially uh, the, uh, the problem between the, the Sunni-Shia divides is very uh, uh, very deep in, in Iraq. It never stopped. Uh, uh, 
and of course there is another uh, another uh, problem which is the problems between Kurds and the rest of uh, Iraq, the KRG and Baghdad, uh, all these differences about oil, about the uh, Peshmerga, about uh, Article 140, about Kirkuk. So these problems were always there. And uh, in my view, there was never a real sense that uh, there will be uh, a complete stable political process. And of course, whenever there is a problem, especially uh, now when there are a lot of problems, not only within Iraq, but within the region, and uh, Iraq uh, since 2003 uh, was always, uh, I mean, the, the, the regional powers were always part of the game in, uh, in Iraq. And they they influence the uh, and still do the uh, political process. Uh, so I think that uh, this kind of of uh, uh, the, the current situation, the current violence, it will not ease really, and uh, it, it will continue until the next election. Every side hopes that the election will change things, but I don't think it will change anything. The things will continue to be like this. Let me just ask a fundamental question. The, the, the headline for this evening, or at least the main question for this evening's debate was, what do the recent deadly attacks um, tell us about the country today? And, and, and there is a, a specific mention of escalating violence. You seem to be saying that it, it, it's been a constant. Do you believe there is escalating violence now? No, I, I really don't think it's escalating. I think it is, it is a pattern. You know, and uh, it it looks that it is escalating, but it is just for a while. You know, it will you will you will find out that uh, this uh, wave will fade. Uh, so it's it's just been I think so, yes a wave pattern for yeah, the last ten years, really. Almost yes, yes. that's what I think. Yeah. Thank you very much. Just yes, Tom, why don't you take? Over? I'm going to, I'm not going to be arrogant enough to even try and match the knowledge of some of the people who are here. I'm going to speak from a fairly narrow perspective. It was the perspective of the fact that in the first Gulf War, I was a British Army officer, and I was specifically, uh, apart from the rest of the war, I spent a lot of time in the North. Uh, in the second Gulf War, I was in a completely different position. I was part of the cabinet office, part of the decision-making process to go to war. So I've been involved in one way or another for a mere 20 years, which is nothing when you consider that Baghdad was founded by the Abbasid Empire 1,250 years ago. Henry Thoreau said that the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. And I think that is very true of Iraq now, and unfortunately has been true for the last 20 years or more. And we wonder why the insurgencies have such fertile ground. Now, I'm not going to talk about the sectarian side, I'm going to talk about I'm not even going to talk about whether it was right to invade or not. I'm going to talk mainly about the modus operandi and how that actually helped to produce the mess that makes it easy for violent men to work. Start reality is that in 1991, first we bombed Iraq almost into the Stone Age. Then we asked the Iraqis to get rid of the dictator. Then we failed, failed to support the uprising. And indeed, we gave Saddam, we allowed him to use the helicopter gunships to crush it. It was then followed by 12 years of crippling sanctions to 2003, which mainly hurt the civil population. While well, we continued to let Saddam, apart from in the north, for special reasons, go crazy, drain the marshes, kill people. 
when we did get in, <coughs> in 2003, we did not have the boots on the ground to fulfil our obligations as an occupier to the civil population under the Geneva and Hague Conventions. Instead, we left reconstruction and security to a bizarre alliance between private and public sector and a bunch of very iffy private security companies. So we had rapacious companies uh, like Halliburton and Blackwater. And they basically taught the Iraqis, just a minute, we're not here really to bring democracy and freedom. It's just another new set of helmets and dark glasses. <coughs> For instance, we kept open Abu Ghraib, one of the worst, most, probably the most notorious prison in Iraq where they used to have the Wednesday executions. And we put some very iffy people in charge. Another problem, I think, is that we failed to grasp the fact that Iraq, like a great deal of the Middle East, has always been hampered by the notion of the Muhabarat state, or the state that's so security oriented that over time it has come to be at the expense of human freedom and personal empowerment of citizens. And I think the same is true of Maliki's government as was true of Saddam. The status quo ante, although the players have changed, is pretty well the same, with the poor ordinary citizen continuing to be disenfranchised and subject uh, to patronage, no matter how many times they go to the, go to the polls and vote. Now, why is this important? Well, at the core of the insurgencies, you've got the usual players. Al-Qaeda, Ba'ath, the Salafists, the Millenarian. But they need a primordial soup in which to work. And in my view, the primordial soup is the poor Iraqi population who continue to be badly served by a government and ministers that regard their ministries and their responsibilities as fiefdoms to continue to milk the population. And we gave them good examples. Thank you very much, Charles. Thanks very much. It was a very good yeah. intro because, uh, in a sense, uh, what I want to see is say something about is what came out of this and what Tom and Cameron already talked about is part of it. And what I'd like to think about this evening is what's happening at the top of the state, in a sense, what, how is power being divided, but also what's <coughs> happening underneath. And I'm not going to look at it in sectarian terms, although sectarianism comes into it, but see what effect this might have. And I think the three things I want to look at, one is the nature of the authority of state institutions. What's that actually doing to people's politics and to their chances and their rights? But secondly, two trends that as a historian of Iraq, one has seen shaping Iraqi politics, not necessarily in obvious ways, but they're certainly there now. One is uh, class conflict, which is very much part of Iraq uh, and Iraqi history and manifests itself in disturbing ways and may well come to do so in the way the people at the top are behaving. And the second is the politicization of the armed forces, which is well underway uh, in terms of the officer corps and their loyalty to the state, but perhaps not to those who direct them. So again, trying to get some sense of that. So if you think about the top of the state, in a sense, my image of Iraqi politics since uh, for the last seven or eight years has been a table with 10 chairs around it. And in the middle of the table is this massive pile of gold, which is effectively oil revenues. And there have been about 18 people killing each other to sit at those chairs. And you could argue that over the last seven or eight years, quite a number have been killed. And there are now probably about 11 people killing each other to sit at those chairs. So they're more or less sitting at them. And so you have this kind of wary stability, as Cameron said, of mistrust. But of course, it doesn't take long to sit around that table, to look at the pile of gold, and to think, well, if there are only eight chairs, there'd be more for me. So in a sense, what you're seeing much of now is exactly that, a competition for the means of patronage, uh, for access to the revenues, a division of the spoils. And if you looked at the fate of a Hashimi, it's got nothing much to do with Sunnism or Sunni Arab. It's to do with 
privilege, it's to do with the guarding of privilege, the stifling of criticism, uh, and so on. And as far as the public at large is concerned, what trust do they have in state institutions? Parliament that sat for 20 minutes uh, in the whole of the year 2010 after being elected, uh, Parliament that has no decisive impact on uh, how those govern at the top, a judiciary which seems to be completely in the pocket of the executive power, uh, and of course a police that you have to be very wary of calling in on your supply. So you have, in a sense, as some people have said, Dick Cheney's ideal Iraq, which is Lebanon which is, was his image of Iraq was going to be, a Lebanon of Zama, of leaders who have carved it up between them. Underneath, however, you also have two features of Iraqi politics and society, which I think are going to feature, which, are, which already uh, show some signs of emerging and which are uh, perhaps going to trouble some of those at the top in some way or another. The first is the notion of if you create class privilege, you create class resentment. And that's been as true in Iraq as anywhere else. So you had visible resentments along those lines of people who find uh, <laughs> public health, of water, of supplies, of gut jobs, of practically anything not there. And so you've seen it very obviously in the politics, local politics of Mosul. You've seen it in Bakuba. You've seen it in Baghdad to some extent, but less so. You've seen it in Basra. This isn't sectarian politics. This is the politics of resentment at those who have uh, skimmed off the cream from the top. You've had the active suppression, murder, and intimidation of journalists and critical journalists, Mahdi Abdul Hadi last year, and others who've been deliberately stifled to prevent them from uh, uh, daring to reveal some of the scale of corruption. You've had restrictive elements of the trade unions, that is, in a sense, the, the crushing of trade unions. The interesting piece of legislation that Grammar kept on the books from the Ba'athist period was the um, criminalization of strikes in the public services, uh, which of course not only did Bremer keep on the books because he thought it was a frightfully good bit of legislation, even if Ba'athian origins, but of course all his successors have as well and they've used it effectively. And what you've got effectively is people <coughs> delivered into the hands of what my colleague Sami Zubaydah has called uh, communal authoritarians. That is people who basically take everything you have and then grant it back to you as a privilege that they have to give to you. In other words, they take away your rights and then they grant it back to you in the name of Shi'ism, in the name of Sunnism, in the name of whatever it happens to be. So in a sense, you have this powerful class conflict is actually reinforcing forms of sectarianism. Finally, the question of the armed forces, which again is part of it. Though the, 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 the picture that we've seen in the uh, media recently and that Cameron was talking about and the violence that Tom was talking about is certainly cyclical. But cyclical, one could be not uninterested in that because obviously it's terrible for people involved. But what I'm interested in is what comes out of that. And what has come out of that is a national security state, a state in which there are more men under, armed, uh, under arms now than there were under Saddam Hussein. So you have, in a sense, the perfect rationale for the interning policing of the Muhammad state, for mm. the creation of armed forces. Not too many questions asked about who controls them and how. When the prime minister attaches the Baghdad brigade to his office, when he creates new intelligence services from the people from Hindia, uh, when he puts his son in charge of the office, not too many questions are asked because it's all in the counter-terrorist fight. Well, we know what counter-terrorism has been used for in other places as a rationale as well. And, of course, for the Prime Minister, a deliberate playing of politics in the armed forces. Promotions, transfers, dismissals through the office of the Commander-in-Chief. Uh, and what that's led to is what one Iraqi army officer described to me as, I was saying, doesn't it lead to a certain ambiguity? He said, no, no, schizophrenia. He says, because on the one hand, you want to be a professional officer, you can see the benefits that that might be possible to be created now in the rebuilding of the Iraqi army. But on the other hand, you know that you don't get ahead unless you're in good light with the uh, people who are your political masters. From the history of Iraq, and I don't want to say that Iraq is a condemned to repeat their history, but certainly it's a warning sign, not just in Iraq and elsewhere. Once you do that, once you play those games with the officer corps, once you use the armed forces and an internal policing uh, service, once you criminalize certain sections of the population, either regionally or in terms of class, you politicize the armed forces. So I don't think it'll be long before the armed forces think we don't need the politicians at all. So again, it's something, again, it's not something that's going to happen tomorrow, next year, or five years' time, but it's something that started a trend which I think is deeply disturbing for what Iraq's history has been. And there's no reason why Iraqis should be condemned to repeat it, but that is a warning for the future. Thank you very much. Finally, last opening round to you, Patrick. Sure. We're talking about Iraq. Uh, um, 
you know, one rapidly concludes this is the one of the world's greatest messes, uh, and one can get uh, very depressed about it, um, and probably one should be depressed about it. But one thing to bear in mind is that the history last thirty years, Iraq has had civil wars, foreign invasions, uh, occupation, sanctions, which have impinged on people more than similar events anywhere else in the world. Uh, you know, you can find mass graves of Shia outside Kerbala. You can find people have found mass graves of Kurds all over Kurdistan and the rest of the country. Um, the Sunni were partly driven out of Baghdad in what was in fact an incredibly bloody sectarian civil war between about 2003 and 2008. Um, and countries just take an enormous amount of time to recover from that sort of thing. I mean, look at the civil war in America, you know, that the present election, electoral divisions very much run along the same geographical lines as the opposing sides in the civil war. I was born now, and we had quite small civil war in 1922, uh, 21-22. It divided politics for the succeeding 90 years. So it's not too surprising what's happened in Iraq there. Um, the, people spoke of the patronage state. I mean, Iraq is an oil state. And in oil states, the state has the money. And the state has the jobs. I remember a, former, a friend of mine who was a former minister in the Iraqi uh, government saying the only time he'd seen panic on the faces of members of the Iraqi cabinet was when the price of oil fell below $50 a barrel. Everything else they could cope with, but that they couldn't. Um, and that remains true. Uh, and in many ways, it distorts a country. It also, in some ways, stabilizes a country. Everybody wants jobs. Uh, everybody wants money. And the money is there. I think, moving on to sectarianism, I think one should never sort of underestimate sectarianism in Iraq <coughs> or in many other countries that have similar divisions. I mean, over the years, for, and I've been going to Iraq for God knows how long, I've always had some really nice people saying to me, Patrick, you completely sort of exaggerate the sectarian differences in Iraq. And, uh, it's not as divided as that when Saddam was still there. Lots of people told me that you know, it's all provoked by Saddam and so forth. It'll all die away. But actually, it goes right from top to bottom. I mean, a few years ago, I had a few people working for me, some Sunni, some Shia, and very nice people, very secular. Uh, but I remember them coming to me, each individually, and saying, look, I've nothing against so-and-so, but just tell them nothing about me. Don't tell them where I live. Don't nothing at all. I'm just frightened to be in the same room in the, as them. And given the, the recent history of uh, Iraq, that's not too surprising. Um, will this change now? I mean, this is a sort of crucial question we're addressing. I mean, over the last sort of maybe five years, Iraq has had a sort of certain stability in the balance of power. The different factions who make up the government, the different players, Sunni, Shia, Kurd, the differences between the different groups within parties. Uh, none of these people like each other. A lot of them hate each other. Some of them try to kill each other. But a certain stability is there in the balance of power between them. And they all have quite a lot to lose if the present system collapses. So despite the very high level of violence in Iraq at the moment, uh, horrific levels of violence, in a way, it has a rather sort of grisly stability. And maybe it will be destabilized, but there's no real sign, to my mind, of that happening yet. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I, I would like it uh, if we took a few minutes for you to debate one another. I'm sure that you've heard one of each other say things you don't necessarily disagree with. Let me see if I can get the ball rolling by asking you, um, is there one group that is most responsible for the worst of the most recent violence? 
If you had to point a finger, who would you point it at and why? Charles, let's start with you. Well, if you think the worst of the violence is the blowing up of people who are just going about their ordinary business, then you could argue that those who target pilgrims and uh, public places in parts of Iraq because they happen to be inhabited with the wrong kind of people, or you're targeting shrines where you know there'll be a large conglomeration. Clearly, the Shia have been on the receiving end, and those who are responsible for that have almost certainly been uh, the Islamic State for Iraq or one of those conglomerates. But it doesn't mean to say that all attacks are necessarily launched by them, but certainly they are the grisliest. The other, I suppose, is the, I think, very pathetic and sad aspect of the hatred for the state, which is not necessarily sectarian, but there's a sectarian element, which is the blowing up of people who are looking for employment. You know, the blowing up of large numbers of people standing outside army recruiting, police recruiting. These are people who are just like them in some senses. These are, you know, sad people who are, who are looking desperate for employment. And they know there'll be a huge crush of people there. So you go in and blow them all up. And who's doing that? Well, I would argue that it's probably both. It's, in other words, it's, it's much more likely to be not simply sectarian driven, but driven by those who think that the government is a puppet of Iran and therefore doing it for Arab nationalist, Iraqi nationalist reasons. People who think that they've been cut out of the new system or they want to, that rather than attack a police checkpoint, they attack the people who are queuing up to man those checkpoints. So that's, that's part of it, I would argue. Alan, what do you think? Well, I think <coughs> it's, it's uh, very good observations. But I still think that uh, the uh, sectarian element is very strong mm -hmm. here. Yeah. Because whenever something happens immediately, when you ask people, whoever, they immediately say, oh, Shia did this or Sunni did this. So Shia Sunni think is always there. And, uh, is it always valid, though? Whether, no, it's not always valid, it's true. But, uh, it becomes valid because people are so focused on these mm. things. Shia, Sunni, Shia, Sunni, whatever. Whatever happens in Iraq, it's either Shia or Sunni. And Shia uh, 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 accuse Sunni, Sunnis accuse Shia. So I think this is the danger of these things. It, all, it, it deepens this, this Shia, Sunni device. This is the problem. Patrick. Yeah, I mean, I'd agree with that. I mean, sort of. You can, I think that that dominates everything. It'll go on dominating everything, um, and it shifts. Depend, depend. I mean, what could, what what could shift outside? You know, that would would destabilize Iraq at the moment. Um, you know, well, Israel, Syria, but probably not enough. You know, to really do it. You know, why is Maliki there? Well. For a number of reasons, he's leader of a Shia party, but he's also, at the end of the day, the people want to get rid of him. Um, couldn't agree about who would replace him. And secondly, you know, the, the Americans and the Iranians found this was a guy who they could live with. I, mean, I remember somebody ringing me up when he got back as prime minister this time and saying, you know, well, finally the the great Satan and the axis of evil have come together <laughs> and decide that Maliki is going to be their boy again, which I think is kind of true. Well, they thought that Maliki was, uh, they could use him, but they, they, could, they couldn't really. Uh, it's always a mistake in history, yeah, isn't it? Anwar Sadat showed yeah. them, you know, they, we'll put him in for a while because he can't do us any difficulty. Yeah, but I, Emperor Claudius, he's a rubbish person. You can put him, so, yeah. you know, <laughs> you have to be very wary of those yeah. ones. And I think Maliki's uh, taken great advantage of that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to use a bit of a police euphemism here. Uh, you know, when police talk about the, the committing of a crime, they talk about three things, the means, the motive, and the opportunity. Well, the means have been around for a long time, and there are mixed motives. I think the key to this present uh, state of violence is opportunity on two levels. First of all, the overwhelming uh, force of the of, 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 of the late American surge before they all left has been removed and basically uh, left a barely trained and highly politicized army. Uh, so that, that has certainly increased the opportunity. The sudden opening of the borders, uh, the, the, the increased porosity of the borders from Syria has also increased this. It's no accident that the Syrian ambassador to 
Iraq, uh, was also one of the heads of a very, very large and important trans-border uh, tribe, yeah. which has big connections not only in Syria, but also, interestingly enough, in Saudi Arabi Arabia. And so this takes me to my next thing. The Salafists and the Wahhabis and the others on the other side in Iran are always there. They're always waiting. They are opportunists. And they, it's, it's been made easier now. And frankly, I think that at the very top level, just as was in the Cold War between Russia and America, to a certain extent, Iraq, eh, like Syria, is a proxy war situation between sa Salafists, i.e. in Saudi Arabia, and, and the Iranians. And I think uh, Iraq, to a certain extent, because of its history, uh, is in the wrong place. Do you, do, you, do you see it that, that way, that I Iraq is where we see the Cold War between the Shia and the Sunni writ large? And sure, yeah, it's one aspect the, of it. All yeah. the f violence is a fallout of that essential. Yeah, it, I mean, it's that. It's, um, you know, since 1979, you've had this sort of, what, I mean, you've, you've had the conflict between Iran and enemies of Iran, varying from the United States to Saudi Arabia to Israel in sort of various uh, overt or uh, covert alliances. And obviously that dispute is very hot at the moment with the war in Syria. Um, and this is interconnected with the uh, confrontation between Shia and Sunni. Um, so, uh, you know, this is getting worse. You look at Syria, it's happening, but look at Bahrain. Bahrain is back to being a sort of Al Khalifa, Sunni total control. Um, you know, this is uh, getting worse almost everywhere. So, um, and it's very difficult to uh, see, see how you get out of that. And this is why, for example, the Shia establishment in Iraq uh, supports the uprising in Bahrain. But they are against the uprising in Syria because they are afraid that in Syria the Sunnis will take over. So always there and I I know because they would come on high level really uh, uh, representatives of the Shia parties and establishment they would come to the courts Talabani or Barzani I heard them and they would always say uh, <coughs> you must side with us we must there must be an alliance a, Sh a Shia Kurdish alliance against Sunnis and same thing Sunni parties would come and say there must be a Sunni Kurdish alliance because we are all Sunnis against the Shia. So, that, that's yeah, I mean, there's this effect, and it affected the the original invasion. You know, did, people always combine the invasion and the occupation of Iraq mm. in 2003 as this as if these two things one naturally followed the other. But actually, I think if the Americans and their allies had stuck purely with an invasion and pulled out provisional government. Most Iraqis by that stage wanted to get rid of Saddam, one reason or another. Uh, but the occupation uh, was never going to work. You know, why did the, why, to my mind, did the Americans do it? Well, they want, they had the age, the same problem they had in '91 when they hadn't uh, supported the uh, Kurdish or and allowed Saddam to crush the Kurdish and uh, uh, Shia uprisings. Was they didn't want to overthrow Saddam and found they'd done a favor to the Iranians. Uh, and the only way you could really not do this, sort of stop, overthrow Saddam and not do a favor was to occupy the country. They didn't quite see this was going to face them with an awful lot more problems. But uh, so you, I mean, you still, Iraq is caught in this sort of network of interests, it's like a sort of net surrounding it. It's very difficult to get out of. I, I'd like to come back to something. Tom, you, you took a lot, a lot of responsibility, if you like, on the West by having, uh, f for having started a war. Uh, and which led to an occupation that set the scene for a great deal of violence and and uh, and and bloodshed. Quite right, but no matter how the occupation was conducted, do you, wouldn't we have ended up here anyway? Wasn't wasn't it just a cork? It wasn't the Saddam the cork in the bottle. Once he was out, it was all going to end up in uh, unremitting waves of violence. I think it would be a brave person that would uh, that would be able to 
predict so confidently any uh, any of that. And I have to put my position quite clearly on this. I, I'm not. I'm not going to talk about the morality or otherwise of the invasion because if you look at it from a Kurdish point of view, it's the best thing that ever happened. Uh, you know, let's be quite blunt about this. What I'm talking about is that the modus operandi, the lack of care, the fact that we, you know, when I when I was a junior officer under training at Santos, we were we were taught that if you were a if you were a an occupying force that, that, especially from a liberal democratic state, right? You had absolute responsibilities to protect the population, to make sure that the seeds of the sort of conflict that are happening now weren't planted. I'm not saying it's the only cause. What I am saying is that the way we went about our business. Right, setting aside the morality or otherwise of the invasion, stacked the odds against uh, a, a peaceful uh, resolution in the medium, in the short to medium term, and that means basically that we we should still feel a sense of responsibility for trying to to get that right. It absolutely drives me mad to hear, for instance that for purely economic reasons, the Americans sold tanks to the Iraqi government. These weren't ordinary tanks, these were Tusk-enabled tanks, whose only job was to be able to go into, into towns and cities and, uh, and attack civil populations, by the way, not to protect the borders, and who are, and, and who are now selling the same, the same mad crowd, uh, Maliki, Ma Maliki Barat, 16 F, uh, 30 F-16s whose only real task, again, will to be able to hit their own population, if need be. Why don't we ever uh, learn to get the, the balance right? Even if we go in with good intentions, we're still getting it wrong by stacking the odds against a, a peaceful resolution. At this stage, maybe I'll uh, open, uh, open it up to you uh, this evening. Can I just see a show of hands? How many people have got questions they're longing to ask. One, two, okay. All right, then, let's begin. Let's begin with you. Hi, um, my name is Prashant Rao. Um, I had a couple questions, actually. Um, I feel like a lot of the talk that was going on was about um, sort of shadow player was Iran, and that we often, any conversation about Iraq often involves Iran. So obviously with the sanctions against Iran and what's going on against Iran in terms of the anti-nuclear push and various things, at what point could we conceivably see Iraq be the big brother in this equation? Is this something that is a, in the foreseeable future where Iran may play a meddling role, but in fact Iraq's oil revenues now are bigger? I mean, it, it's not inconceivable that in the future Iraq's army could, could be more powerful, these kind of things. I mean, is this something that any of the panelists see in the foreseeable future? as something that is a potential shifting between Iraq and Iran as a potential... You're talking about a power shift in the region? Exactly. Uh, no, not uh, within the region, but specifically talking about Iraq, we often talk about how the role Iran plays and the sort of control that Iran exerts over Iraq. So is it foreseeable in the future that Iraq could it maybe not exert that role over Iran, but at least be an equal player in this relationship and that they could hold its own and perhaps not be, you know, what critics would say is a puppet of, of Iran. Okay, considering especially that the, uh, the government and the majority is, is a Shi Shia government. Patrick? Yeah, but I think anybody who's sort of, I, I don't see this happening. I think Iraq will remain a weak state for the reasons we've all been talking about because of the sectarian ethnic divisions and because the parties and groups are all divided within each other. Um, and Iran is a more sort of cohesive state uh, but uh, Iraq isn't a pu they, they, they aren't puppets of the Iranians. I mean, anybody who's ever treated yeah. Iraq or Iraqis as puppets has normally had their sort of fingers bitten off. You know, it doesn't. Uh, um, yes, they all have foreign supporters. Yes, they're proxies. But they're proxies just as long as they think it's in their interest. Charles, you want to yeah, well, I suppose it's also, I mean, it goes along with what Patrick was saying, that there's not just one Iran in Iraq. There are plenty of Irans in Iraq. And Iranians play games in Iraq with each other, against each other. So you have 
different faction than Qom, who've got rather troubled relations with Khamenei, have much better relations with Nejef than Khamenei has. So they play that game. You have the Revolutionary Guard in the <coughs> south, who has amazingly good business connections through Basra, mm -hmm. but uh, sees it as its fiefdom, and it's not going to let it go to the central government. So you have, in other words, there are lots of, lots of uh, different bits of Iran, of the Iranian state, playing different kinds of games. I think the one thing that does unite them, and this goes to the, the heart of what you were asking as well, militarily, they're all united that never again. 1980 will never happen again. So in a sense, whatever other games they're playing, that will never happen again. And they're determined that that should be the case and probably have the means to enforce it. What do you think? Well, I think it's, uh, it's wrong to say that uh, Iraqi Shias are puppets of Iran. They are not puppets. They are, uh, uh, Iraqi Shias are uh, considered themselves to be Arabs and uh, not uh, Persians, and you know, the, the historic divide is, is still there. It's deep inside the, the Shia religious establishment. Uh, Shia Arab are the origin, and uh, those are, they came, came later, the, the Persians. And you know, it's still uh, socially, there is a big difference uh, between the mentalities of, of uh, of both sides, and uh, uh, it's for for a long uh, period, uh, a Shia Iraqi Arab Shia would not really give his daughter to a Persian Shia uh, because you know he he is he's above above that. So, but they have interest, common interest. Shias in Iran and in Iraq, as well as in, in Lebanon, in Bahrain, Shia are, uh, 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 they still have this mentality of victims uh, in, in the region, in this uh, surrounding of, of Sunni uh, states. So this is why they stick together. They have an interest. It's, it's like a survival security interest. Uh, and obviously, uh, here it's very mixed, the interest between the two states and the interest of Sh Iraqi Shias and uh, Iranian Shias. But uh, uh, I, I don't think it's, it's, uh, it's a question of puppets and masters. Uh, the, the great historic lesson in, in some ways was uh, the Eight Year War. There was no sense during the, I mean, if, if you think that Shias make up 60% of the Iraqi populace, if they were going to turn against the, the Ba'ath Sunni state, that was their opportunity. And they didn't take it for the reasons that, that Cameron said. But also, if you look at that eight year war, because nothing happens in isolation, that eight year war was fought basically to a standstill. And, the, and Iraq was bankrupted by it. And it was the, it was the bankruptcy of Iraq and the, sudden, and, and, and the drastic drop on the oil price and the inability of the Kuwaitis specifically to compromise with Iraq over the oil price that then led to Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. Now, up until that time, in what I think is rather a naive, simplistic view, and believe me, I think that Washington can sometimes be very naive and unsophisticated in this. They basically regarded Iraq as the bulwark against the terrible Iranian uh, axis of evil and supported them and gave them anything they wanted, at a price, by the way gave them anything they wanted in arms and so on, until they reached the point, until Iraq reached the point. And this is quite a, this is quite a story, actually, if you go into the detail, until Iraq reached the point where it couldn't even service the interest on the debt that it owed for, for arms that, I, that it had bought in advance based on future earnings to the, to the West. And what did the rest of the Arabian states who, who basically said, oh yeah, you're a bulwark against Iran, do. They shafted Iraq as well. I'm not saying that, that Saddam wasn't right there, but 
he basically he invaded Kuwait because uh, he felt that he'd been shafted by Kuwait. You cannot run a military uh, regime like that without it, frankly, being a constantly supported proxy. At the risk of uh, of uh, 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 of. Uh causing Kelly Niktajad, who's in the audience, to feel a little ill at ease. I just wonder if I might ask you, Kelly, to say a few words about the way Iran sees Iraq from the inside of Iran. I should say Kelly run a very influential website uh, called the Tehran Bureau and uh, knows a great deal about what the dialogue inside Iran is. Can you just give us a few words about how Iran sees Iraq, how the Iranian government sees Iraq at the moment? I, um, I think most of what I've been exposed to is the, the, the propaganda. I mean, it's like there are brothers, you know, um, you know we're, the, we're neighbors, we know each other. You can't, um, you know, it, it, it was a miscalculation for anyone to think that, um, you know, they could divide them. But um, and, you know, and I mean, um, there's, you know, very close relations between Najaf and Qom and Mashhad and, you know, and there's actually, I think there was a lot of intermarriage, um, you know, during the war and after the war. I've been meeting more and more people who say that, you know, the, my, mo my mom's, you know, Iranian, my father is Iraqi, and so... But is there anything in the public discourse or in the state discourse uh, that suggests that Iran sees Iraq as, as a puppet state or sees this Shia-dominated government as their sock puppet, if you like? Um, I think they've been careful not to go there, um, you know. Um, and, and I think that, um, you know, the way it's been described is like they, they do enough in Iraq um, to give America bloody nose to let them know that if they do want to do something, they can do it. But in terms of rhetoric, I think they're careful not to, you know, kind of cross it. I mean, that's been my impression so far. Thank you very Sorry. much. Well, okay. the, the, yes, go ahead. I, yeah. the, uh, Iran really has a big trouble sometimes to deal with with Iraqis, with Shia Iraqis, yeah. and. Uh, uh, Every time when the Iranians have an interest or they want the Iraqi government uh, to go in a certain way, uh, they really t t try very hard. I mean, they, it's not like they just come and uh, tell Maliki you should do this and do this. No, they go, they talk to them, they try to convince them, and sometimes they don't get what they want, really. I, I know this from, from uh, experience. And, uh, but they, they, they have, of course, uh, uh, influence. This is why they try to use different Shia groups against each other, the Iranian, in Iraq. They supported Muqtada al-Sadr, and then when Muqtada al-Sadr was a little bit tried to become independent, they created Asaib al-Haq, uh, supported uh, Asaib al-Haq, which split from Muqtada. So it's not, it wasn't always easy for the Iranians. But the difference between Iran and all other powers uh, uh, that they know Iraq very well. They know everything in Iraq. They know uh, in details. Uh, they know the people. They know the, by names. I always remember when Ahmadinejad was coming, visiting Iraq. Suddenly he said there, there was a program uh, what he should do and who, who he will see, but then suddenly they said, "Well, we want a uh, he uh, he wants to meet with with all the uh, academics, the heads of uh, universities and departments in Iraq, and the 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 people in the president's uh, office panicked because they didn't have uh, a list of them. They said, "Don't worry, we have a list." <laughs> so they, <laughs> <laughs> and they, they, they produced a list of everybody else. So they know everything. Else. So that uh, leads me to ask, to what extent might they be using the Iraqi government now for sanctions busting, for go doing an end run around sanctions? Well, I think they are trying uh, to, to use Iraq, and uh, trade between Iraq and Iran is really prospering. It's, it's never stopped. <laughs> All right, next question. 
Um, you, sir, and then you, and then you, madam. How about that? Um, I was just wondering, when you guys look at Iraq's situation today, how much of a role do you think Saddam's leadership played in what we see now? And so to what degree can you imagine things kind of basically being the same if Iraq doesn't have a Saddam in its past? Uh -huh. How don't we go right yeah, to the left? Well, yeah, I don't start. Um, Saddam, yeah, but not only Saddam. I mean, Iraqi violent, uh, politics always pretty violent, you know. King Farouk sort of sailed out of Alexandria when uh, the army took over, you know, the revolution in 1958 in Iraq, you know, they machine gunned the king and everybody else coming out of the palace. It always was pretty violent. Uh, Saddam was an expression of this, this extraordinarily sort of excessive violence of the regime, causing as many problems as it solved. Um, but yeah, I mean, that he's part of it, and he's part of what I was saying earlier, that you, you, know, you, you have Saddam, but you have this you know, incredibly ferocious war between Iran and Iraq for eight years from 1980, you know, hundreds of thousands of dead, uh, wounded prisoners, the invasion of Kuwait, you have the uprisings in uh, 1991. Um, I think, I mean, you, you know all this, but it's sort of, it's somehow one has to have experienced this to know how it colors every aspect of life, you know, um, that when people have sort of seen the bodies being taken out of the mass graves, these things don't get forgiven for generations. Saddam is part of it, a big part of it, but not the only part of it. Yeah, but, well, this is, <coughs> uh, that's true, and, and Saddam was always, uh, uh, behaving like uh, Stalin, only, who used to say, if somebody exists, so a problem exists. If he doesn't exist, there's no problem. So, but uh, the other side is the nature of Iraqis. I always, uh, sometimes, where in the uh, some Westerners, uh, I, I think they always try to criticize themselves that they didn't deal with Iraq well. It's true. But uh, Iraqis have also a very big uh, responsibility of what happened to Iraq after 2003. And uh, one of the, uh, of the uh, reasons is this violence. Iraqi people are very violent people. Uh, and uh, so that's a problem, you know. Uh, killing, getting rid of, 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 uh, the, of the other is... Uh, uh, something which, uh, which sometimes is like a, a nor, nor, normal thing with among Iraq. So that's another. Thing. You're interested in whether the American invasion and particularly the American approach made it worse, right? More just how much on what you see today just bears Saddam's signature, and would it be different without him? Well, oh. that that one is a historical study <coughs> on its own. But if I if I take a couple of key points in the, the, the career of Saddam and at the Ba'ath. Right. Uh, when the Ba'ath, uh, you've got to remember that, uh, especially from 1958 until, you know, we're talking about 1968 that year, the, 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 the amount of what I would call uh, gratuitous violence that took place in Iraq was considerable. And then basically what the Ba'ath did is that they imposed a sort of Hobbesian solution on Iraq. Basically, you know, the sort of Hobbesian idea is that the state is that entity that has the, has the monopoly on, on, on violence. And basically what, what he was able to do uh, through the Ba'ath was to create a, an infrastructure. Right? And that infrastructure, of course, was one that was determined by the original Ba'ath uh, philosophy, Th that cell infrastructure that, that pervaded and invaded everybody's life to the extent that families couldn't trust each other uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. That was the sort of uh, society. That he, and what he tried to do uh, was to create the Bath ideal, which was the sort of national, socialist, secular Iraqi state. 
But what happened during the war, and I'm talking about the Eight Years War from 1980 to 88, was that towards the end of that, uh, the Ba'ath as, as a standalone entity uh, was begun to be seen by the tribes who are very, very important and still very important in Iraq because they have survived all sorts of invasions and so on. Yeah. You, could, you should never underestimate the tribes and the tribal leaders. Right. Uh, and, and basically what Saddam realised after that was that he couldn't continue in that programme. So he reintroduced, uh, he, he, he re-enfranchised the tribal leaders and their patronage uh, and started a new phase which culminated in the, in the introduction, if you remember, of the Takbir onto the Ba'ath flag in 1991, just before we invaded. And so, but what he then did, cleverly, is that he instructed the cells to become Islamic again, to fall in love with the tribes again. <coughs> The faith even, campaign. Even the Fedayeen, it was a big campaign. Faith campaign. Which completely again changed the, the nature of the society so that when we, so that when we invaded in 91 and in 2003, even more so, there was a completely different substrata ready to tackle us, created by him. And I will tell you now that what we have now, because even al is still active, we think he's in Qatar at the moment, but who knows. <laughs> uh, what, what, what we see now is that these old links, these old coruscating links, still exist. And it's these links that he created uh, very cleverly, he wasn't a very clever man in many ways, but he was here, uh, are still the main roots for the Salafists and the Wahhabis and all the rest of the fruitcakes to come in and do their damage. And what's made it worse is that the one time when we had a chance to write this using the Awakening Councils, <coughs> we, it was again botched once the Americans left. That wasn't continued by, uh, by Maliki. But yeah, you're right. Uh, what happened was Saddam and the Ba'ath created, if in many ways, the infrastructure that still allows the, bath, the mixed Ba'athi AQI uh, Salafists to come in and, and wreak havoc. And as I said, going back to MMO means motive and opportunity. Right. There have been periods when it's been more difficult for them. At the moment, because of the, the new porosity, particularly of the Syrian border, and to a lesser extent the Jordanian, uh, they can again use these routes again, which to some extent were starting to go defunct. Charles was like it. Yeah, I don't think, I, I mean, I, I agree with everything that's been said. I think that um, you could argue that what Saddam helped to do and therefore was to build on things that long existed in Iraq I mean, in mm. many senses. He did them in a more exaggerated way, patronage, violence, and so on. But at the same time, he did do something which you could argue uh, was, has had a legacy, which is to make Iraqis fear the state in a way they'd never feared it before. Mm. Many had feared it, but in a sense, it became an object of fear. Mm. And it seemed to be, if you were an Iraqi, you got two lessons from that. If you fear the state, you can do two things. One is to protect yourself against it, and so you fall back on your tribal, right. your communal, <laughs> uh, your ethnic groups, people you can trust without the state, or you determine to seize it, to capture it. And if you look at the whole generation of Iraqi politicians now, al-Maliki included, they're all products of Saddam Hussein. Mm -hmm. They all look at the state in much the same way as he looked at the state. And that's one of the problems, as we were talking about before. They have this very exclusionary view of how you use power and are not exactly scrupulous about how much violence you use to cement it. The Mohabharat state. Yeah. So, I yeah. mean, in, in a sense, he's still there, uh, if not in person, and certainly there's nobody fighting to reinstate Saddam Hussein, uh, but there is, as one Iraqi said, you've left us, you took away one, you left us with 50. In other words, there are lots of little Saddams. Did you have something to add, Haider? Uh, Haider al Safi's in the audience as well. He's a journalist and uh, who's been jo journeying back and forth to Iraq a lot recently, uh, 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 particularly with a view to having a look at how the media is a player in the, in the current <coughs> politics. Why don't you go ahead? Oh, thank you, Lisa. Uh, I was intrigued by the question by, of uh, the gentleman next to me about the signature of Saddam Hussein on what is going on uh, nowadays in Iraq. But let's uh, reverse the question 
and put it, what is the signature of the Americans on what is going on in Iraq? Let's talk about, for example, uh, what Patrick said about the eight years war between uh, Iraq and Iran. It took the United Nations nearly six years, or <coughs> five years to produce 598 mm. to stop it, as well as the Americans were not happy. Like they were providing more of, I would say, uh, maps and uh, satellite uh, information to Saddam, and but not arms, by the way, just a correction. There were no arms, I don't think. It's mostly the Iraqi army was armed with Russian weapons. And then it's 1991 when Saddam invaded Kuwait and the Americans insisted on a complete sanction on the country, which destroyed the uh, middle class and, the, mm. and mostly like those people, uh, the educated elite. And when people lost the mean, they went to religion and religion became very powerful. And Saddam himself, like when he went, as you said, to the faith and the American like kept renewing the sanction for 13 years until the invasion. Okay, now it's also there is a very like important factor that the Americans didn't have bo enough boots on the on the on the ground. That means that they let the uh, cities being looted by the mobs, and then it, they allow this the Iraqi state to evaporate. It doesn't exist anymore. Like none of the civil servants would find even a chair to sit on. And because of this mass mis uh, massive mistake of not having enough troops on the ground, most people who were already aligned themselves for nearly 13 or 14 years with religion, they went back and they looked around and they wanted to find authority. Suddenly Saddam Hussein and the Ba'ath Party disappeared. And the Americans are not interested to represent any authority or not to impose any law or order on the ground. And the only two, two uh, I would say, two uh, parties who were like there were the tribes and the mosques. And those both established their authority. And the people started to look at the mosque first or the imam or what he's going to say. And then they would follow their instructions. And that's the time, that's the I would say the fatal mistake of the Americans, and they created a rival they need to negotiate with. Right, and we're the fallout we're watching exactly. today. Exactly, and uh, can I just finish one la last thing? Okay, we need to move less, on. Less than that. Okay, go on then. And also establishing the political parties coming from outside. Most of the Iraqi people were not allowed to have a satellite receiver. They didn't know who is who. That's they right, know yeah. names. Mm -hmm. They didn't know any kind of ideology. So they didn't align themselves with any kind of, whether it's communism or Dao party or other any party. So the Americans, when they created the government council based on sectarianism and quota and ethnic uh, origins, they created this kind of division of what we are having now, of having a president representing certain kind of ethnicity and having a prime minister representing certain kind of sector. So that's what's the signature of the Americans. Sorry for me. Thank you very much. Can I just pick up on that a minute? It's yeah. very important to, 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 to realize. We I mean, need to move on yeah. fairly soon, so keep it brief. We're, yeah. I know we're making the Americans, it seems to be the, the fall guy here, but uh, maybe there are good reasons. It, it, it's often forgotten that leading up to the invasion in 2003, there, were, there was a big conference in London in December 2002, but that was preceded by a number of important workshops uh, in the UK and in America from October onwards. And uh, some of the decisions that were made at these workshops by, by the opposition, which were clearly quite, uh, quite sensible decisions, when, when it came to uh, the, the boots on the ground being on the ground, uh, even if they'd wanted to, uh, the, 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 the coalition forces couldn't support any of these decisions, any, any of these sensible decisions for, uh, for a transition to, to democracy in the way that they did because of the boots on the ground issue. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, um, thanks. I'm just wondering, um, after all this, what, what initiatives do you think the international community could support to, to help Iraq at this point? Are there going to be governance solutions, economic? mediation efforts, and, and which organizations or countries do you think could best help at this point in time? 
or is it better not to meddle? I mean, are there positives to build on other opportunities that could be built on here? Do you want to have a go at that, Charles? Well, I suppose it, it depends what you're trying to encourage in Iraq. And clearly, there are those who see Iraq as a huge field of economic opportunity and therefore see the building up or rationalize the building up of private enterprise on the basis of uh, the oil wealth of Iraq as something that will create what they hope is going to be a more liberal system. I think that's completely flawed. I think it'll make a lot of people very rich. I could be made a lot of people rich in Iraq, but it won't, as any more than it did in Tunisia or in Egypt, produce uh, a democratic or an accountable society. Um, the other area, I suppose, is when there's really the possibility of uh, conflict, and this is where Kamran will talk more about, between Kurdish and Arab Iraq. That seems to me somewhere where, at the moment, not. I think any international meddling in there would be seriously problematic. But I think, given the tensions, given the problems, given the ambitions in Baghdad and the fears in Kurdistan, that may be something to prevent that reoccurrence of that conflict. There may be something there. But I, my own feeling is what we've been describing about Iraq is not something amenable to concerted international effort at all. I mean, I think that one of the problems is that uh, one of the powers of patronage is to keep people dependent. And you don't want some outside agency coming in and saying, no, no, we can help you in this way. I think there are ways in which you can help. You can boost the solidarity of trade unions, but you can't actually help the trade union in their fight against central government if they're determined to suppress you, but you can alert people to their plight, you can have human rights organizations alerting people to the existence of secret prisons and the use of torture. This is all and not to be decried, but it's not really going to make that much difference strategically, I think. Okay. Well, I agree really with what he said, but I think uh, uh, unless the Iraqis themselves don't uh, decide to help themselves, there is no point really in, in outsiders to try and do something and they because it will only make things worse. Anybody else want to add anything? No, and anybody, anybody who's interfered in Iraq, first of all, the interest of the Iraqi people hasn't exactly been their first motive and usually it's um, worked out badly. I mean, most recently the Turks were involving themselves. Didn't do much good to Iraq, didn't do much good to the Turks. So, uh, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, all these uh, foreign interventions have been uh, um, generally malign in influence. And support to elections, will that help? Sorry? So the elections in two years? Well, uh, Iraq has its own uh, political dynamic, you know. It doesn't matter if they support it or don't, you know. I mean, these elections are quite real, you know, but it's, uh, I don't really think it'll... Uh, it's going to make much difference. Uh, and also, you see, it's an oil state. It's more difficult for them to influence. A lot of states in the Middle East, how do, how do foreigners influence? They use money. Uh, there's one of the people always talk about the American uh, army there, but one big influence was American money. One time they were spending a lot of money in Iraq. The whole Iraqi, uh, the Makabarat used to be, in, didn't have the entire budget was paid. Yeah, that's and right. That yeah. <laughs> the, uh, and, um, and um, somebody got up in Parliament, I remember once, and said, you know, how come our intelligence service doesn't seem to be in the budget? You know, are these all guys all volunteers? <laughs> <laughs> the, um, but they're paying. So, I mean, anyway, I don't want to go on, but it's um, a good thing that people came out. And actually, they are generally keeping out. Of yes, you have a question. Go ahead. Um, the, the recent spate of uh, international oil companies going into uh, and doing, uh, sort of signing production sharing agreements with the KRG suggests, at least to me, that they feel that Kurdistan or the KRG has a future and it's quite stable, both in terms of being you know, a profitable venture, but also in terms of being politically quite stable. And I wondered whether you shared their opinion and you also felt that this was, I suppose to put it crassly, a good investment. I mean, would, would you put your money in Kurdistan? Do you feel that it will be uh, politically stable? from that perspective that they that they clearly hold. Can I feel this one? I think that you <laughs> should feel this one, yes. Uh, I'm somewhat, I'm a bit biased, so, but I don't look at, even with the bias, I don't look at Kurdistan through rose-coloured spectacles. I, I was there in Kurdistan uh, in 92 when against all of the odds, 
and when everybody told them it couldn't happen, they had uh, they had their first uh, democratic elections. That democratic election was not supported by any Western country apart from the tiny little uh, uh, a tiny little uh, German Landstadt, which decided to give them a little bit of help. I remember standing there in the big, the big open-air auditorium when Masoud Barzani, who up until then always wore uh, Sam Brown with a pistol, stood at the auditorium, took the pistol. Of course, in these days, of course, it was always a feu de joie, which you had to duck from the bullets coming down. Uh, and he took his pistol out of this thing, slammed it on the rostrum and said, that is the last time I'm going to wear this. Yeah, but come on, Tom. No, no, what no, they no, then no. had was a very long civil war. Well, let me finish. In which he finish. used his gun repeatedly. You, you, inter so it's, uh, you interrupted me. I did, I rightly that. so. Yeah. <laughs> you interrupted me before I said that. Now, this only worked to a certain extent. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, in 1995, I left in high dudgeon because, uh, under you know, while we were protecting them, they decided to have a messy. Uh, a nasty and unnecessary civil war. So it didn't, it wasn't all roses. And, but they themselves, I think, uh, have learnt quite a tough lesson from this. And looking at the transition from Barham Sala to, from Nechevan Barzani to Barham Sala back to Nechevan Barzani gives me uh, some hope uh, for the future of, of, of the KRG as an, ent uh, as an entity. And, uh, and I, I've been working quite hard with the UK National School of Government as we've been slowly improving governance across the area. And also the point you're making about the PSAs, the production sharing uh, agreements, what you said actually there was quite significant. One of the big differences between the KRG and their approach to oil and the rest of Iraq, is that the Iraq still use the old-fashioned, totally opaque service agreements for oil, whereas the Kurds are actually using uh, much more transparent production sharing agreements, which they actually publish in the International Oil Journal. So that itself <coughs> is an indicator of things moving on. There are lots of rough edges, uh, I agree. And I get mad at them sometimes because uh, it's one, two steps forward, one step back. But I think the general direction of the KRG is, uh, is, very, is very, very positive. But the price is staggering. When you think there hasn't been a single serious uh, terrorist incident in the KRG area since, since 2004, that's because... They field almost twice as many soldiers on the ground to protect that as we have left in the entire British Armed Forces. Well, I, uh, of course, we as Kurds are not uh, entirely happy with everything which is going on in, in Kurdistan. But uh, in general, I agree with Tom. Uh, we have learned a lot of, of lessons. and. One of, I mean, from my point of view, more important thing is that the main uh, parties in, in Kurdistan uh, uh, are learning, uh, learned a, an important lesson, and that is how to manage their difference and their crises. Because there are still, of course, differences, there are still rivalry. But they are managing to, uh, to control that, uh, which is, I think, which is uh, important. And there is also the sense among all parties, among the people, that the, uh, the, the, only, the, the uh, single uh, evil, which should not repeat again, is in fighting. So I think this is uh, important. Uh, and according, I think the the Kurds uh, about the oil. Uh, I think they have uh, great uh, uh, hope that uh, the investment in, in oil by the Western companies will 
uh, will help them consolidate their situation and their influence and their strength within Iraq and uh, maybe as a step for going further than being only a federal part of Iraq. Do you buy it, Patrick, as a, the oil industry being a sort of a barometer of better yeah. governance and stability? Yeah, no, the big oil companies uh, were none too happy in the rest of Iraq, but they cut, I mean, the, the Iraqi oil ministry cut some very tough deals with them. I mean, they were accused of sort of selling out. I think because the Iraqis are very conscious of the one thing they've got is oil, so the one that you don't dare do is uh, sort of um, be seen to giving in to foreigners. So people like ExxonMobil who went into KRG, I think because they found they were, uh, weren't making money elsewhere. Some people are doing quite well, like BP, but so I think it does reflect um, a certain confidence that uh, it's still going to be there. And one thing which is changing, and it may not destabilize, but it's one thing we haven't mentioned, which is really the last two months is a really big change in the region, which is that the Syrian army has withdrawn from Kurdish areas in northern Syria. There are about 2.53 million Kurds in Syria, many of them in the north. They've withdrawn from these northern areas. Suddenly you have an autonomous Kurdish enclave, enclaves along that border, which is very much what happened in Iraq in, uh, 90, in the early 90s. And suddenly the whole southern border of Turkey, land border, uh, is facing Kurds who are autonomous. This is going to have a big effect in uh, Turkey, rejuvenate the uh, Turkish-Kurdish insurgency. And it will have some effect on the Iraqi Kurds. But this overall Kurdish nationalism, I think, is getting stronger. Uh, I think this is a big change, uh, which people haven't really uh, noticed very much. But overall, yeah, I mean, you couldn't occur to KRG. Is it corrupt? Yeah, pretty corrupt. But it's not, it's not Baghdad is kind of, I remember somebody in about 2004 saying to me, <coughs> it's going to be pretty bad here, but it could, will it end up as being a bit like an Arab oil, st other Arab oil states, or would it end up like looking like the Congo, in which everything gets stolen, or most things get stolen? And you know, and it, it seems to me it's turned up like the, the Congo, but the KRG with all its failings, you know, completely different atmosphere, peaceful, you know, uh, things going right that aren't going right in Baghdad. So it's not surprising people have confidence in it. I think. I think we have room for okay. <laughs> If, if we're quick in our answers, and maybe I, I could ask uh, w one of you to answer each of the following questions. Maybe the questioners could direct the question. So we had this lady, you, this gentleman, and you, l the man in the checkered shirt. Uh, let's see if we can get through that. Okay, I'm going to choose my uh, person to answer, if that's okay, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is Lina Khatib from Stanford University. The question is on Syria, actually. Um, two things, uh -oh. and you can choose <laughs> what you wi want to focus on. One is, would you like to say more on the impact of what's going on in Syria, uh, on, you know, uh, on, on Iraq, especially that the insurgents that are now kind of becoming more empowered in Syria are very much the same ones that used to cross the border back and forth. What is this, um, you know, what's the impact within Iraq? And perhaps Considering the, I know the context is different, but considering the several similarities between the dynamics in Iraq and the dynamics in Syria regarding insurgents, regarding uh, sectarian uh, relations and their relationship with the state, uh, regarding the West's failure, what lessons can Iraq uh, give us that we could use for Syria? Well, I think on the first question, uh, you have two aspects, it seems to me, that which are, well, three, I suppose. One is the logistical question. So a logistics driven by which side of the Syrian struggle you see yourself on. And so it seems to me that you have you know, Iran trying to ship things across Iraq, whether by air or we don't know. And then you have uh, things coming up from Saudi Arabia to precisely the Anbar and the Western province, which, of course, used to work the other direction. So the fuzziness of the boundaries. So you have that question. You have the second, which is the, the geographical fuzziness of it all, which was referred to in terms of the uh, Iraq, uh, Syrian ambassador in Iraq and what that means. And effectively, one could argue that all that area is completely out of control of the Iraqi government. So 
it's an interesting question because the reassertion, and some people have seen the attack on Hashemi as being motivated by that. In other words, it's teaching one bit of Iraq that they have to toe the line with Maliki because Maliki can't actually enforce it uh, out there. And that, from what I've heard, it is really problematic trying to enforce anything. And I suppose the third thing which feeds into this and comes out of it, which is the reinforcement of this sectarian perception, which you've seen in other ways. You, you can read something in a sectarian way. So if you feel that way, you can see this as a sectarian struggle in Syria, which reflects that in Iraq. And we're going to win in Syria. We lost in Iraq. And, and there are people I've talked to who see it like that. I'm not saying all do. But so it has that reverberation, which is not exactly what Iraq needs as well. So I think those three areas are really really mobilizing it. What kind of lessons? Uh, well, <laughs> well, I think one lesson is the one that they've already taken, which is don't go near it. I mean, it seems to me, you know, you look at Cameron and <laughs> how they're talking. Have you been Blair in, in Down Street? God knows what would happen uh, in that sense. But it's this sense that, you know, anything short of intervention. So you use proxies, you gutter, most improbable proxy of the world, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, you, you encourage them. You say, it was this wonderful expression that Hillary Clinton had, we're there for you, she said, for the opposition. You think, Hang on a bit. You know, empathy, very nice. You know, how good. So I think that's probably one of the things, which is that one of the things we've talked about now, one of the lessons of Iraq, that in a sense was coming out of what people are saying, is that if we hadn't gone in, so what would have made a difference? So, I mean, get rid of Saddam Hussein, then get out again. Ah, so in a sense, it's exactly that for Syria. Let them fight it out, see what happens. Yes, sir. Yes, I mean, Christopher Booker uses his column in the Sunday Telegraph to promote an Iranian opposition group based outside Baghdad called the Mujahideen al Kulk. I'm just slightly bemused that you, you, a number of these columnists, so Melanie Phillips is another columnist, using to um, p p promoting this Iranian opposition group based at Camp Ashraf. And of course, obviously, they, they, they don't mention, of course, that the group, of course, used to be sponsored by Saddam Hussein. So I'm just interested in one or two, maybe you can elucidate as to why Christopher Booker and Melanie Phillips are so keen on, on the Mujahideen al Kulk. You know, and, well, uh, the Mujahideen al Kulk has gone through strange transformations in the, in the yes. uh, forums of the West. At one point it was uh, seen as uh, um, uh, vitriolically against the Shah and therefore against Western interests. Then it transformed itself into something that was against Khomeini and therefore was possibly pro-Western interests. And that's when I remember <laughs> walking outside uh, Waterstones on Gower Street where you were always people would come up to you with these terrible folders of atrocities um, to say, uh, you know, and you weren't supposed to just sympathize. They'll say, we take credit cards. You know, <laughs> so the reason I, and as far as I understand, I mean, Patrick may know more about this. It, it's odyssey in America has been very peculiar through the American Congress. So you had people, you know, putting it on the terrorist list and then lifting off the terrorist list. And for some reason, because it's seen as an opponent now in its present transformation, because it's whatever it did in the past against the Kurds or Saddam Hussein, horrendous things too. Uh, and because it's a weird cult, let's face it, in, of the Rejavis, I mean, it's strange. Uh, because it's seen as being, in some sense, against the, uh, the Iranian uh, government, against uh, the Islamic Republic's regime, uh, because they portray themselves as the right kind of Islamist, uh, in that sense, whatever that is, uh, they, in a sense, have, have been taken up. And they're very assiduous in their cultivation of Things. I mean, one of the things that was very noticeable before they were put on a prescribed list in England was, they, like Mormons, they looked a bit like Mormons. They all dressed in suits and uh, white shirts and black ties. And they all went around, or not black ties, actually, but th they all went around, as it were, lobbying, very conscious lobbying effort uh, and very targeted. And I imagine it's had some kind of echo. I don't think it's had much echo here, but I think they have been taken off some list here as well. But it's had some echo in Congress. But... Yes, well, I, I, surely blowing the whistle on the tents was the yeah, big, exactly. the big coup, yeah, yeah. the big mm. pro-American um, uh, move, which uh, I'm an employee of an American network, and I can say that mm. they're extremely well organized, and they always mention that as their calling card exactly. for being able to explain what else they'd like to do or what else they... I yeah. mean, extraordinarily yeah. well organized. So perhaps that goes some way toward answering your question. Mm. I think somebody should write a sort of thesis on them, actually, because yeah. they've got it sort of how a, a group like that, they have money and they have their cult, they have committed people, but they're quite, I remember writing a piece about them, uh, without thing, which was just taking a human rights report, citing people who had, uh, leaders of uh, Mujahideen e Kalk who had uh, defected, saying how they'd murdered various people and uh, so forth. And immediately, 
they sort of rang up the independent every sort of hour. <laughs> One woman rang up in tears and said she was going to go and, on hunger strike outside the foreign editor's house, <laughs> which I've never seen a more appalled foreign editor. I thought, uh, so if anybody wants to intimidate a newspaper, that's probably a good reason. Um, but you know, in America, you know, they're also just money. You know, you, you could get former chairman of the Joint Chiefs turns up to address them. You know, I think they paid him what was it, thirty thousand dollars? I can't. It was a good, you know, for one hour of his time, a lot of money. No, the, no, they're assiduous. I mean, they don't pay. Right? I mean, they they go and lobby. They don't go away. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember even ninety one during the bombing in Baghdad, I was in the Al Rashid Hotel. And one person you were guaranteed to turn up when the missile's coming up, you'd be thinking about how long you were going to live. And, so, and suddenly a figure in a suit would arrive. <laughs> and it would be the Mojadine Calc representative. And, you know, and it would, journal journalists would take flight and hide behind pillars. This was incredibly boring. But, it, uh, but you know, they, they were there. They had that organized. Yeah. I think I but, but I think they're also yeah. incredibly dangerous. Yeah. I think they end up as guns for hire. It's been rep reported in the New York Times and otherwise that the, you know that the Israelis operate through them. You know that they're very. There used to be Palestinian groups like this too. That very extreme, but basically they ended up in somebody's pocket. I think. I think uh, I'll use two two names t as an object lesson in choosing your friends carefully, uh, because if they seem to speak the same language as you, you can be led down very dangerous roads and I only have to mention two names for this, one in Iraq and one in Afghanistan. Always remember where Osama bin Laden started and who first sponsored him and his people and also uh, in Iraq, uh, Ahmad Chalabi. I think I only need to use that name to make for, to, for you to understand that we've got to be very very careful how we choose our friends and not just to be, if you want, seduced by the language that they use that seems to fall in with our pla plans at the time, whether they be the present government or, or, or that wonderful triumph of Wolfowitz, Cheney and uh, Rumsfeld. I think we have room for one more question, yeah. uh, if you can make it short. Um, yeah, sure. It's, it goes back to the KRG discussion. And I just wondered if there were any comments on the prospect of independence, pushing for independence, ah. um, and sort of if that's a realistic scenario, what might it lead to? Do you have a, a, any of our speakers? Uh, Who, whoever feels most strongly. I, well, like, Has occurred? Uh, like, uh, it's, it's not yet, but like uh, Andy Murray said, getting closer. <laughs> <laughs> so years? Well, it's, it's very difficult, really. But uh, the, there is now the one very important change in the Kurdish society. Uh, the, uh, the tendency and drive to be independent is very strong, especially with what's going on in Syria and Turkey. People, young people especially, who really don't know anything about, uh, don't remember even Saddam Hussein, and this is, this is uh, a, a new thing, because after 2003, they were looking towards Baghdad more. But now, no, we want independence, we want our state. So this is uh, a very s strong feeling among the people, but uh, I hope that the political establishment uh, can really uh, calculate well and don't uh, take decisions uh, which will wreck everything. I think the political establishment in a bill is very pragmatic. Yeah. Uh, and they, they know that even to begin such a process, uh, they would have to fulfill a number of steps. Uh, they are well aware of, for instance, the, the, the route that Kosovo had to take. They're more than aware of all of this and the sort of international support they would, they would have to have to even begin that process. So uh, I think although obviously there's a natural, we used to say in the British Army that every private carries uh, a field marshal's baton under his pillow. 
And I think it's the same with every cud, and why shouldn't it be? They are the, they, they are the largest disenfranchised nation uh, in the world. So why shouldn't they carry that? But I think, fortunately, the, uh, the, the, the pol politicians are being pragmatic about this. But of course it's a name, and why shouldn't it be? They deserve yeah. it. And the, the one thing is that, you know, they, they have a good life. Uh, I mean, things are well, good in Kurdistan in, in comparison with Iraq. And I, I think uh, they all have in mind that they don't want to lose, to lose it. So they will be very cautious about it. On that note, I'll bring this evening to a close. Uh, we've ended up on an upbeat note about the Kurds, but I think we ended up on a very uh, bleak note for Iraq, that this violence is not necessarily escalating right now, but is a continuum, and there is no end in sight. Thank you very much to all our speakers. Uh, and thank you very much to all of you who came out this evening. It's been a real pleasure, and I know that we'll be here, and the speakers will be here in case any of you want to come and uh, ask uh, supplementary questions when we break up. Good night. <laughs>